Hello, hello. I think we still have participants to join later. You know that this is fully recorded um, and we are all welcoming you um, from wherever you are and whenever you will listen to that because it might be later than our actual live discussion we are doing now for one hour. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm Daniela Elsner, head of Unifrance Promotion Agency for French Film and TV Worldwide. And um, I'm even prouder because I have great guest stars and I uh, introduce um, um, Brian Ayerhaus, um, an animator, researcher, director of an animation at the Interlochen Academy of Arts in Interlochen. You will, in Michigan, you will tell us more about that. You are also um, the director of, uh, international, of the International Animation Day. That is actually what brings us here today for the Association ASIFA International, but we will go into details of that a little bit later. And John Coven, you are director of the Department of Animated Film at the very prestigious school, Le Goublin, which is in France, in Paris. Even we see that you have a nice background with the Eiffel Tower that we didn't want to, to cut out. So we have like animated uh, um, uh, backgrounds and uh, John, you have your Eiffel Tower background, which is very Olympic game. <laughs> um, we will think of our Olympic games. Uh, which is great. So you are director of department at uh, Goblin, but also you come from, I think, a long history in Hollywood on storyboard. You worked with very famous artists such as Steven Spielberg, Tim Burton, John Favreau, Ben Stiller, and many others. And we will go into these details um, a little bit later. Uh, to all of you who are with us live today, you can ask your questions. I think someone wrote it in the Q&A session, um, uh, um, um, uh, which are, you will see there is a button on the, on the line down where you can ask your questions and we will take them. Sometimes I take them in the middle of our discussion, sometimes at the end, and you will have, I will stop early enough so that we can really go into questions if there are, if not, I'm so curious. I have many, many of them. And um, the first thing I really want to know, um, and I think, um, well, before we start, no, I have to tell you a little bit about our um, reason of Unifrance to be here today, because we have actually right now um, <clears throat> our new um, my French Animation Days running. My French Animation Days got totally inspired by ASIFA and the inter the, uh, inter the World uh, Animation Day, which is actually the 28th of October. Um, we thought if ASIFA in Mich out of Michigan and all over the world, they do something around animation all over the world during this month and especially on this day, we want to be part of it as French animation. And uh, we thought of different uh, things we could do during that day. So we work with schools for really um, young kids to explain a little bit how you make animation. And we are very proud. We had many producers helped us on that. So this is in the hands of the teachers right now in different schools all over the world, especially French speaking schools. We have two panels. So today our panel, we had one that is already uh, uh, registered and on YouTube uh, with Jeremy Zag, uh, who's the creator director of uh, Miraculous, the film, and Lady Berger, TV series, very successful one, with his producer Aton Sumar. And over the next month, if you are somewhere in the world, look it out. Maybe you have the chance to be in a city where one of our French animation films gets screened within our My French Animation Days there will be a little bit of animation on the top of the screenings. So um, maybe you should look it out in your city if you are somewhere around the world where we have a screening ongoing. So that's for Unifrance. We do many more things you will see on our website. You can also follow us on all the uh, social media. Don't hesitate. We need, we need people to watch what we are doing. But now I go. Um, John, maybe I start with you. Um, uh, John, you um, tell us... First of all, a little bit about you, because that's starting point. How did you come go into animation? Did it, was it like something you were dreaming of when you were age of 10 and you thought, that's it, that's my life? Or did you decide much later? Um, I decided much later to make it my profession. I was always drawing. I think I was known in elementary school as John the Artist. 
And I was always fascinated with, with drawing. I also was lucky enough to have a father who was an amateur photographer and he had um, an amazing Super 8 camera. This is in the 1970s when it, it, it was it was very difficult to make a movie. And my father had all the equipment needed, including a camera that had a cable release in it that allowed you to take one image at a time. And I didn't, I, I did stop motion with it. I didn't draw and do 2D animation, but I was fascinated. I And I mixed live action things that I would shoot with animation and which oddly be many, many years later became a big part of my career actually. Um, so there was something in there from the beginning that was working me over. But, but then it took me a very long time uh, to come to the idea uh, of, of doing animation. And by that, I went to art school. I'm obviously an American, you know, judging by my accent. And this was going on in Los Angeles where I grew up, but I, I, I took uh, my journey in a faraway land and, and came to France and through the very generous policy of the French uh, uh, government studied uh, art in France, first in Paris and then in Strasbourg and um, studied illustration. And then I, illustration and, um, and cinema, you know, the marriage was storyboarding and I just fell into that. A lot of my career was not so much of some kind of great plan, but just following my passions and seeing where it led me. And I would say that this, I've had many, many interests in life and done many different things, but the three passions that, that ran throughout my life, at least, you know, from a, a very young age, uh, were uh, drawing and cinema and France. And so <laughs> they eventually led me, those passions by following them, not really knowing what would become of it. They led me to filmmaking. I started as a storyboard artist in live action film. And then later in my career uh, started in animation. And then one last thing, talking about not having a plan, but the universe obviously had some kind of a plan for me because um, because I had this experience in live action filmmaking and, but I could storyboard animation, uh, something happened where just at the right time where Hollywood started making more and more hybrid films that are a combination of animation and live action with actors talking to animated characters, or even like with The Lion King, a film that is an completely animated, but in a photorealistic style, the one, the, the, the remake with Jon Favreau um, and the upcoming prequel Mufasa. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, then I became part of a relatively small group of people in Hollywood that storyboarded a lot of of these hybrid films that were that look as though they were photographed, but are actually animated. So it's passion all around first. And then I assure you, we didn't talk about this. I discovered that France is also part of one of your very important, <laughs> <My passions. laughs> which is good for a promotion um, uh, agency as us uh, for French films. But we come back to you, to your prestigious school after Brianna. Would you say that passion also was the thing that that drove you maybe towards animation and oh, teaching uh, also? Because we didn't talk about it yet, yeah. John, but teaching also. Yes. Um, so I'll tell a little bit about my background. And I would say that um, the thing that drives me is magic. It's the ability to make things come to life that that uh, um, uh, captured my attention when I was a child. And so I started out uh, in middle school drawing um, and doing flip books. And, um, and then I, I saved up my money to get a Super 8 camera so I could do my own uh, animation work uh, when I was a kid. And so it's always been something that I wanted to do. Um, and... 
then I went into illustration. I got my degree in illustration, my undergraduate degree. Um, I'm from Michigan, as you can probably tell from in uh, United States, as you can tell from from the way that I speak. <laughs> and um, and I love being in Michigan. And um, uh, so it has always been kind of the thing that uh, nature and uh, animation and magic have all kind of driven me as a person. And so finding a way to um, be able to do animation, illustration, and then later on web design and all these kind of things led me to work in commercial animation uh, so that I could have time in my life to be able to make my own short films, which was really what drove me as a person was creating the magic, bringing it to life and 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 uh, just that thrill, that thrill of of the excitement of of uh, aliveness, bringing, you know, the Frankenstein kind of moment of uh, it's alive. <laughs> and, uh, um, so uh, as an animator, I am um, I am um, self-taught and I have my degree, as I said, in illustration, my master's degree is in drawing and um, so I have uh, spent most of my uh, career working uh, independently uh, as a freelancer doing everything from TV commercials to um, anything that I, I could so that I would have the time in my life to do my own short films. Then the last thing that I ever thought I would get into was uh, being an educator because putting two words together in English was really hard for me, even as an English speaker. <laughs> so I found myself able to, um, uh, you know, I would say things like, that's the last thing I'll do is be a, an, a teacher. And then I fell in love with it. I got a chance to try it out, uh, thanks to a friend of mine, Deanna Morris. And uh, that led to uh, finding out that really mentoring and being a part of the lives of um, and the magic of other lives and being able to help inspire those lives and help help them find their dreams uh, became my dream, became part of my dream as a person. And so I have loved it. I taught college for many years. I was a tenured professor um, at Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And then I had the opportunity to come up to Interlochen and start a brand new program for high school students. And I can, I'll go into that a little bit later. But um, anyway, that's kind of like what my journey has been, uh, really uh, kind of in a sideways kind of manner of, uh, of discovery. And as, as John was saying, um, passion also is absolutely key to it. I, I chose, I always chose, not, I chose not to work in, um, Los Angeles or other places because I, I was following a different passion for me. Um, and, um, yeah. And then I can talk about international animation day and all the connections to France because I love France. And, um, anyway, so that's another story. Maybe we, before we come back to the animation day, John, um, John, you are, I mean, in France, Gobelin uh, is one of the most famous schools. Um, I think it's very difficult also to get into the school. No? It's a very, uh, it's not so easy to be selected. Um, when, how did you, when did you connect from your work as a storyboarder in LA? Of course, you like France, I got that, but how did you connect to Gobelin? And uh, um, how did you also see Evolve? I think something, Brian, we didn't say you are a woman, uh, animation is not necessarily uh, the place where the most women work naturally. So did you see John also over the last years, maybe um, a change on that? So two questions, actually. Um, I started a, uh, a branch of women in animation. Uh, actually, I didn't start it. I'm the faculty advisor, and there's a group of young women uh, at Goblin that started a, a, a branch of, of, of women in animation. I think it's a, a great organization and really important. Um, there's an interesting, there's an interesting uh, problem there. Goblin is, I believe, the number is sixty-six percent uh, uh, women right now. There, it, and that's I think true uh, generally in in uh, animation schools. There are more there are more young women than than men in uh, animation schools, but. There is then a glass ceiling, and that's the thing that uh, women in animation tries to address: is that 
it's difficult for women. They either become frustrated that they are, are not allowed to access higher levels uh, within the industry, or there's the difficulty of, of, of raising a family uh, and having a career. And so they address things like that and, and they do really great work. So that's, 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 yes, I see that as, I see that as, as a problem, but I'm glad to say that it's a problem that now uh, in the contemporary scene in animation, it's a problem that's being addressed and taken seriously. So, but I wanted to say before talking about um, education, I wanted to to say that uh, I, that Brianna is she's so right with the, her magic um, idea. I I looked at it. The thing I love about not just animation but filmmaking in general is that it's all an illusion. And the more that I could push that illusion the happier I was. That if I could make you believe you were seeing things that you were not seeing, in fact, I mean, that I got a real charge out of that. And that's kind of, you know, being an illusionist is another term for being a magician. But I often thought that may, you know, I often wondered why didn't I, why didn't I become a, a magician? Because I, I like, I like th that the whole idea of illusion so much anyway. Um, I can I just butt in there sure. for a second and just Jump say in. that um, the only reason I didn't become a magician was because I could never fool my dad with my tricks. <laughs> that's yeah, that's not yeah, that's not fair. Your dad knows you too well. Um, so I I didn't actually I was wondering now, why didn't I include education in uh, my list of passions? I think it's because I came to it a little bit later. Um, but you know, my story with, with education is that I, I stayed in school so long, uh, and then I started, I, I, I finished my degree in France. I came back to LA, started working and six and a half years later, I, I was back in school teaching first at art center in Pasadena, which is a wonderful art school. Um, and then Otis, the Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. And I, you know, because it hadn't occurred to me, I wanted to stay in school forever, but I was like, I'll, if I stay in school forever, I'll be an embarrassment to my family. So I have to graduate at some point and start working. But then, then I realized, oh, I can stay in school forever as long as it's, I'm on the other side of the desk and I'm a teacher. And so I very quickly went back to, uh, to school as a teacher. And then it was it was my wife's idea actually to come back to France. I was teaching in America and in Hollywood and it was her idea. She wanted to spend a year, a sabbatical year in France with our children, put our children in French school for which they have just about forgiven us. And, and so I, I said, fine, but I'm not gonna be a tourist in Paris. You know, I lived in France for six years and so the uh, the obvious thing to do was to teach. And so that was when I, um, that was 10 years ago. And I uh, was first put in touch with, with uh, Goblin. And one last thing, my, my wife said to me a very, very long time ago when, when we hadn't known each other that long and I was working in Hollywood, she said, I was already teaching then, but just adjunct faculty teaching every once in a while but really my real career was, was working on films. And she said, I think your third act is going to be teaching. And I, it was one of those, she's had these moments of kind of clairvoyance where she could see into the future. And I, I said to her, oh, pfft, no, 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 no. So look, look, look at me now. Brianna, so you are teaching, you are making your films, you are, um, yeah, so you have already many things to do. So one day you said, oh, great, ASIFA, it's a great association. I join or I, I'm not even sure if you don't, didn't create it. But but how this, did that come up in a very international oh, sure. context out yeah. of uh, Michigan in a way? Oh, for you. sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, ASIFA, just a little background. ASIFA has been around since 1960 and started in Annecy um, in France um, with... Um, some very famous animators uh, became part of that, uh, started that, um, including um, Norman McLaren and John Hallis. Um, 
And the goal with the CIFO was to help negotiate, or not negotiate, but help to uh, facilitate understanding between countries and between uh, people around the world using animation. And it was a professional organization. Um, and the goal uh, was built into it through UNESCO. Um, so it was affiliated with UNESCO and uh, during the Cold War. So during a time of uh, where the world was fraught with a division, um, not like we haven't seen that before, like here we are again, um, uh, ASIFA was uh, part of that kind of cultural exchange of ideas and support for each other across those borders and barriers. So um, my involvement with it is very much on the local level to start with. Uh, <clears throat> So um, ASIFA has chapters in over 40 countries in the world. Um, and because of that, uh, there are three or four chapters in the United States alone. And so I got involved with a local chapter here, which is the Central Midwest chapter. And uh, in that process, uh, I started working with uh, creating what we were going to show for International Animation Day. Now, International Animation Day is an event that happens, like you mentioned, on October 28th every year. Um, it's been going on since 2002, and it was also started in France um, as a way to um, do a cultural exchange. It really fits in with ASIFA's plan, a cultural exchange of work so that we can um, both celebrate um, the things that we have in common as humans, and we can also celebrate the things that are different about us. Instead of trying to be homogenous, we can all like agree that it's lovely, that there are differences and there are different ways of seeing the world. And animation communicates across all these barriers and all of these ways of thinking and seeing and lifestyles and governments and all sorts of ways animation communicates. So once a year we share these, uh, we share as animators our work with each other so that they can be shown and displayed across the world from everywhere from Iran to China to all through Europe to uh, Central America, all over the planet, uh, we are showing animations. And so that uh, was something that I was doing on the, on the local level, uh, trying to uh, put together what we would see in the Midwest. And then that led to the opportunity to do it for the international uh, level. And so I have been doing that for, I think the last five years, but I've kind of lost count of how long I've been doing it. Um, and it is, uh, one of the joys of my life is that I am, I am about the idea that one person can make a difference in the world and that I can make a difference in the world. And I saw this opportunity with ASIFA International. It's, it's not an organization with a lot of money, but what it does have is the greatest storytellers in the world who are part of that. And we have the greatest medium in the world that communicates to everyone, doesn't matter your age or anything, it communicates. And it's having its heyday. It's, it's really uh, so much of the world loves animation. And so I saw this as a way to communicate and make a difference in the world by joining forces with other people who are like-minded um, and making a difference as a group. I can make a difference as one person, but as a group, we can make a huge difference, I believe. We can steer the ship a little bit away from the iceberg. That's that's the goal, is that we all are in it together, working on it. So it's the same reason I teach. It's because I'm seeding the future with, with the students um, who are going to be the leaders in the animators for the future, the visionary people. It doesn't even, I don't even care if they're animators in the end. What I care is that they're creative, that they're visionary, that they're making a difference in the world and for positive change. So that's a little bit about ASIFA, um, I think. <laughs> I rambled a little bit, but there we go. Thinking that there's one thing I, I wanted to address about animation. Would you say, um, John, Barana, you, in your experience, you are, I mean, Barana, you just said it, it's a universal language, but John, you were between France and, and the US. You, have your school in France and you went back to the US and there was like, is there less, bar are there less barriers 
for animation specifically than maybe in live action? Is it something more universal? Because um, we notice also as, as for French animation is one of our top sellers in a way. Uh, it sells better than live action uh, actually or any other genre. And it's also a lot of children for TV series, for instance, they watch animation in the morning i don't think they care where it comes from um even though you might have different values in it that's one thing we want to address but but there, there's no nationality it's about characters and you can easily i think address so is there something like you think it's it's in it's an international language itself animation i think definitely it is um something that's very interesting that was pointed out to me, I, it wasn't something I noticed, but the three countries where animation is uh, has um, the largest industry are the same three countries where uh, comic books or, you know, graphic novels, bon dessiné, have the largest uh, industry as well, America, France, and Japan. And so it's sequential art. I, I don't think that that's I don't think that's an accident. In France, there are several reasons why I think the French animation industry is so strong. Um, some of them are cultural, uh, bon dessiné, obviously, um, but some of them are also a decision made by uh, the French government. There, you know, the the CNC, the Centre National du Cinéma, which is obviously, I believe, is I don't want to misspeak here, but I believe is the parent company or the the parent of Uni France, and um, that they uh, have actively um, supported the animation industry in France, uh, uh, going back a long time. I think. Also culturally, I think, just think that France. Just look at the painters in France. The the everything from the impressionists to the Dadaists to the academic painters in the nineteenth century. France has a, 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 a long and illustrious history of visual arts. It's part of the culture, and so um, that those those things all combine. You know, in um, in a way to that that has been very very lucky and fortuitous for the French animation industry. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out is that at Gobelin, um, starting in 2016, we started an international program parallel to the French program, and now it is the it is. Um, as big as the French program. So it's 50% international from 53 countries, speaking of the international language. So 53 countries um, in the international side, and then the same exact size in France, in the, the French students, but we mix them together immediately as soon as they come to the school, which means that all the, um, all the instruction at Gobelin is in English. Um, and I think that makes for a really rich, um, because because Fran because English is the the international language of cinema as it is with so many things, um, and this makes for a really great um, uh, blend at the school because the French students come with this this tremendously rich visual culture. And then, and then the international students come with all of the cultures that they bring and, and mix together. So the international students benefit from the French students and the French students benefit from all, all, of, the, all of the different cultures they're exposed to. So it's, it's a really great thing. I, I'll talk more about, you talked about how difficult it is to get into Goblin. That, that is true, but we are actually uh, doing more outreach to high school students in um, France, not only in Paris, but in other cities in France and trying to make our education more inclusive. Before, just a question on that, because um, maybe uh, some of those who will listen to us today or later are asking, how, what, what, what do I have? Um, actually, are there some specific skills that you think 
um, you should have, of course, passion. I think that we all agree, but something else when you think, okay, this is really, really very important. You both of you come out of drawings. No, I think you were, um, is it still something that you need? Is it something else, John? And then maybe Brianna, what do you think today? Well, I, I like to distinguish between hard skills and soft skills. You know, passion is a soft skill. Uh, um, there are, you know, at Gobelin, we are very oriented towards um, hard skills, which would be drawing and an understanding of animation and movement and weight and things. But also we've not just expanded into uh, an international program, but we've also created, one thing I'd like to emphasize is that animation is not just about drawing or just about being, a, the animation industry is composed of many, many different uh, professions, well, not really professions, but it's, it's composed of many, very different specific skills. And so we have, in Paris, we are a 2D school, mostly based on 2D animation, which involves a lot of drawing. But we have opened a campus in Annecy now for 3D animation, character animation in 3D which is very, very different. Um, that involves uh, uh, animating three-dimensional uh, uh, puppets, basically, and in, involves an understanding of animation, but does not necessarily require the drawing skills. And then we also in Paris have a program for animation producers, which is yet another uh, 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 part of the the animation world and we've just opened a program in visual storytelling for people which is more based on writing um uh so there are all these different ways to approach animation and, and if you love animation i would stress that that drawing is one avenue to come out of it but it's to come at it from but it's not the only one I would agree 100% with John. It's not the only avenue to come into it. And when I review portfolios for Interlochen, I'm looking A, for passion. Uh, I'm looking for creativity. Uh, um, and then, you know, students are coming in with a variety of uh, capabilities or um, what, what have they had access to to make something with. Uh, um, sometimes it's these days, it's mostly digital skills that they're able to access easily because everybody has an iPad or has an app that they use to draw with. So a lot of it does tend to be that way, but um, I'm really more interested in how they are problem solving within their animation, how they're creative, being creative with their what resources they have. Um, and I feel like um, because animation goes in so many different venues and different ways of looking at it and different ways of seeing it. I, I have to focus our program, and so I've focused it mostly on 2D animation and on physical animation. So working under camera with stop motion, sand, paint, uh, different kinds of materials and animating that way, because I feel also that it's really important for my students to have their hands get dirty and to feel the materials and to you know, it's all about feeling their bodies, feeling the materials, feeling connected, hand, mind, body, all those things together. Um, I think that that leads to uh, a greater depth of of movement and um, and creativity. Um, so that's part of what I end up doing. But yeah, your school people come from all over the world, also, or yes, yes. Uh, that's why it's from, also very uh, international at least no? countries. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we're, so just a little history, we're oh, almost 100 years old, uh, we're the probably premier boarding school in the world for the arts, it's a high school, where students come, uh, and they spend their, their high school years with us, depending on where they want to start that process. So uh, they could study for four years animation at our school before going to college. Um, and it's a very robust program that we have with our students. Um, 
the school as a whole is known uh, for its music, um, and they say that 17, 18% of all the orchestras in the United States are made up of alumni from Interlochen. Um, we we have a summer camp that we run every year where we 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 have probably 75, 80 animators that are joining us during the summer to uh, work with us. We do storyboard intensive weeks where we're working with people. We bring in people like James Sir from Gravity Falls and other piece, you know, other uh, TV shows to work with our students. Um, we had uh, Don Dixon this past year uh, work with our students, uh, who's another animator, and um, we've had uh, Julia Pott to the um, to our campus to work with our students also. So um, a variety of different um, uh, people work with our students, but we also have, as I said, about 75 students in the summer that work with us, and then during the school year, my program is uh, around 15 students, so it's a very small animation program where it's it's hard to get into because of that. But uh, we have students from Russia to China, um, South America. We've got a couple different students from South America this uh, um, working with us, and so uh, all over the all over the world uh, coming in um, to Interlock and to study not all the all the arts. Animation is also something, I mean, you mentioned production. We had Adon Sumash, a great producer of animation with us. Um, uh, he also, I mean, we all know, I think one thing you need in animation is also patience because not only for financing, but then also to actually make films and to, you said it's magic when it comes to life, but it takes quite a time to, uh, to come to life. It's also something about working together, no, maybe, even more and on a long-term relationship. Uh, is that something that you also, like you try to make your students really aware of that and, and the yeah. team as, as working as a team is important for you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that they have to do is uh, collaborate together on their first short film. They'll spend every year they're at Interlock and they'll make a short film. Uh, and the first film they make is as a group. So they have to work out those group dynamics uh um but we do things as a whole program where we're working together we're working on a documentary right now that's uh, in on sus sustainable and uh, regenerative farming uh and that's in our film program and we're also going to be working on it collaboratively doing animation for that uh for that documentary film feature film so we do things like that we um we we sometimes I shut down classes and we spend three weeks working on animation around the th a theme like peace and we'll make short films about peace uh, um, where we have to work on collaborating together. Then there are larger collaborations that occur because I'm at a school that is so multidisciplinary. We have musicians working with us. We have theater kids. Uh, we have visual artists. Um, we have singer songwriters working with us. So we're mashing it up and because when we mash up the arts then that's where new ideas come out of it i think and we get out of the silo thinking of just like i'm just doing this thing and that's what i love no go see an opera go see a, a play go hear a, a pulitzer prize winning poet speak on campus because all that is available and accessible to students at interlock and it's amazing yeah if i can jump in all of our um, all of our thesis films are group projects. So if you guys go and look at our YouTube channel, the uh, the graduate thesis films and the um, the Annecy films that are shown every year at the Annecy Film Festival, those are all made by groups of students because we believe that one of the skills we're teaching is the idea of being able to collaborate. And over a long time, maybe something, I don't know if everyone is aware, but we, we speak, we've spoken a lot about ANSI. I think we have to <laughs> maybe just a word on the ANSI Film Festival we are all working with because it's the one festival for animation uh, worldwide. And I think uh, um, if you listen, if you don't know, if you want to go for animation one day, if you have the 
possibility in a way to spend a couple of days in Ansi. It's in summer, it's uh, nice, it's very full, so it's complicated to get there. But um, I think to dive into the world of animation, I think there's no better way than to spend a couple of days uh, in this beautiful city Ansi. It's in June, usually the festival, you can look it up. And uh, I think it's something where you can see pretty much everything, work in progress, students, buyers, sellers, uh, producers, financing producers, uh, doing promo I mean, artists doing promotion, uh, schools presenting what they're doing. So it's a real, uh, I think, um, great position. And it's, I think, Brana, uh, one of the, um, I mean, there are many animation film festivals, but this is, I think, the one that is really, in a way, you can pretty much in a couple of days see a lot of different facets. So uh, if you are interested, look it up at their website. It's it's crowdy and you have to go there in a way you have to be clever. But if you are in, I think it's a very passionate way of discovering what animation is, not only maybe what you think of a drawing. So, um, well, we, we spoke about a lot of things, of course, the skills you need. Um, I mean, we... I, it was interesting because I asked also Jeremy and Aton AI, uh, what do you think? Is it a threat? Is it possibilities? And then Aton said, well, but AI is already, we're working with it in animation anyway. Um, how do you think, uh, Brianna, of the last years, you said you work a lot with stop motion, you wanted people really get hands on animation. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's changing also, no? So what what is the, what are the challenges a little bit that you think will come up um, in the in the in the near future not far future but in sure. the near future so when i think about um when i think about ai i think back to when photography was invented in france and then it was spread out generously around the world as a gift to the world from france and when that happened um there were a lot of people who made a living as uh, portrait painters and they made a comfortable living I would imagine portrait painting. And then suddenly someone could go into a studio and get a photograph taken instantly, essentially, of, of them and not have to sit around for hours while someone painted their portrait. So out of that, there was a need to innovate, I believe. This is my theory, is that innovation occurs when there is a challenge. Otherwise, we can sometimes just be complacent and enjoy you know, doing the things we like to do. Um, but when there's an innovation, it pushes us to reevaluate what our creativity can do. And out of, the, out of that, I believe impressionism to abstract art to all sorts of movements of how do we see the world and how do we engage in it in unique ways. Um, so I believe the same will be true with AI, that it will push us past our comfort level and we'll have to start thinking about how how do we innovate movement? How do we innovate uh, the way that we see and perceive uh, animation? And how do we um, how do we get the hand of the artist as part of the process? Uh, harkening back to you know the 1890s, uh, the hand of the artist kind of movements of you know uh, where people would stand in front of the stage and we would film them doing the animation so that we would know it was so real that it was like a real person is making this. So ways that we can see the the finger marks in the work or um, we can we can be in touch with the human in in the piece, even if we're using AI as a a tool for some purpose in the process. I believe that the innovation, the creativity, the human understanding of relationships and are, are going to be even more important um, and going to push us to innovation. John, what do you think? I think that was very well said, and I certainly agree with all of it. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a dangerous game to try to predict the future. Um, and so I don't think anybody can say exactly what uh, AI, what, what, uh, the result is going to be or how it's going to affect things. There's going to be certainly like, I think that was a great e example uh, of um, the photography and the portrait painter, especially the miniature portrait painters. Um, there was a whole industry of making little tiny portraits and lockets and things. Um, but uh, so I think there will be a certain amount of destruction 
Uh, but at the same time, it, it uh, I think that Brianna hit the, the the nail on the head that that there a machine is a machine, and and that human beings are going to be the ones to push culture forward uh, for the moment, at least. Uh, AI can simply look backwards at what has been done; it cannot really create. That's a, that is a human trait. It's one of the things that fundamentally makes us human. Uh, and she mentioned using it as a tool. And I think that that is exactly what it is, at least for the moment. And as with all the other tools that are available to young people, this is a fabulous time to be young. You know, Brianna and I had to use these Super 8 cameras that were ridiculous. And they, the film would get jammed in the projector and then burn up and all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of ridiculous... We were, it, it was like the stone age and we were using these primitive tools. And now it's fabulous that with an iPhone, you can make, uh, uh, you can make a, an animated film in 4K and project it on a giant screen. And I just, you, it really, the tools mean that your creativity is really the only limitation. And I think that, that especially for young people, AI will be another one of those tools. Do you think, speaking of, uh, well, creativity might be the only limitation, but on the other hand, you also have to get all this finance or if you have a project. Do you think that compared to a couple of years before, animation is more in the spotlight and gets maybe more easier the fundings or is it the same struggle as for many years? Um, I don't know, maybe it, John. It, yeah. Well, it... Um, getting the funding for any film is a struggle. If you think that it's not, you're just kidding yourself. It is always, always hard. Um, uh, Jeremy Clapin, who made I Lost My Body, was a guest at Gobelin this morning and talked to our graduate students and talked about his uh, journey to get, uh, how many years it took him to get the funding for that film. Um, it's it, it, in filmmaking is a, is an expensive collaborative uh, medium and it's always you know going to be a, a struggle that's just part of it um but again i think that now it's great for for young people because they have they have these various tools that they can use uh they can they can do surprising things with uh with with the tools available um in you know, and once you graduate from once you graduate from school and you go into the professional world, then you know the the idea of the idea of getting your project funded is a is a reality. And we talk to our students about that and the difficulty of it as as well. Um, but it's interesting. There are I I. Um, I've put together with uh, Goblin, I've put together uh, deals with various agencies to represent our graduates. And the various agencies have very different purposes. Uh, one of them is a very Hollywood agency and it is about pitching ideas to studios in Hollywood, uh, pitching ideas for series, pitching ideas for feature films. Those are heavy lifts. They're long-term projects. It takes years to get them funded. Um, there are other agents that represent animators for things like music videos or television commercials. And there, they encourage the students to continue working on their own, very much the way I would encourage young people before going to uh, art school when they're still in high school to do. And there they say, hey, if there's a band you like, do a, a do a, a music video for them on spec and, and maybe the band will pick it up. We'll get it, we'll get it to the manager and see if they like it. And so I think that there's again, like I said, the, there's there's not just one type of of skill necessary to work in animation. There's also not one kind of animation or one kind of animator. It's as varied as as everyone's unique personality. The world has expanded so much. The opportunities and the struggles have expanded. So 
I was just at Ottawa at the International Animation Festival there uh, a couple weeks ago, and you know people are making careers out of TikTok, uh, out of putting their animations on TikTok and getting branding deals to go with that and having millions of viewers watching their work uh, as they're working from home doing that. So it's about lifestyle and what their goals are as a person. Um, and uh, and then you have people like uh, Vivian, um, oh, what's Vivian's last name? Vivian Medrano, who did Has Been Hotel, who started out YouTube, uh, Kickstarter, then got picked up by Bento Box, Bento Box and Amazon, and then Amazon Prime put the first episode out, and it was the top episode ever of anything that they've ever put out now has a three-year deal with Amazon for their work, or two-year deal. I think they just signed a two-year deal. And um, is going gangbusters at a time when the rest of the industry, when it comes to industry fluxes, is in a, in a low point right now. So finding ways to enter into your creativity and your storytelling that um, I, I think there are a lot of different ways these days to find find those grounds and find, and it just depends on, is your goal to be uh, an artist working in Hollywood on an assembly line, or is your goal to be a, a creator of a TV show? And I'm really, when it comes to, just as an aside, what I'm doing at Interlock, and I'm really interested in making students who are fearless and who are, who are leaders, who can think about what they want to do with these skills in, in a variety of ways. So I do like, and we do pitch workshops where they're working on, I bring in a show creator. I had, I mentioned Julia Pott from Summer Camp Island, HBO or Max uh, TV series. She came and worked with our students last year to do workshopping uh, pitches and they work together across campus, uh, all different kinds of artists working together. And then we presented those pitches live on stage in front of an audience and had people zooming in to give them critiques on those uh, those live pitches. Um, and, you know, I, my goal is not that they're going to necessarily be a high schooler who gets their own TV deal, but that they are continuing to think of themselves. You laugh, but I think it could happen. Um, but they think of themselves as um, someone who can do that, who sees that as a possibility, because the thing that stops most people in their tracks is they don't believe that they can do something and they don't try. Yes, you have to believe. But John, that's why I wanted to, I'm still puzzled because, okay, you are, let's say you are in France, you're doing um, your illustration schools in France, you go, you have, you have your degrees. I think you published also in France. Uh, I don't know if that was before you went back to the US. And that then suddenly you go back, but then you go back to Hollywood and you said, here, hey, hello, I here am I. And um, can I, Steven Spielberg, Tim Burton, I'm I'm ready to work for you because that's exactly what you said, Brianna. How do you how do you get back and you say, oh. I'm here? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't my first job was not with Tim Burton. <laughs> that that took a while. I like to, to say that um, it goes back to the passion. I like to say I paddled around in the cesspool of low budget filmmaking in Hollywood for five years and, and it didn't get anywhere, but I didn't care. I was so in love. Once I finally decided that I was going to make movies and participate in that, I was so in love with everything about it that I just kept on working and it was a ladder and you climb one rung at a time. You meet somebody, you have a good experience with somebody work. And, you know, it's hard. They're long days. You, you show that you're willing to uh, you show that you're willing to make whatever sacrifice is necessary in order to make the project. You work with people. They they realize that you're talented and they can trust you. They call you again. And then everybody, you know, we all pull each other up by, you know, you, the 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 when you when you meet somebody that you've had a good experience with then when you need somebody they're the first person you call and then you know if they jump ahead of you they'll call you you call them and but you know we're talking about i let me <laughs> let me just leave leave it with this so now i'm a member of the academy of motion picture arts and sciences I, I I was invited to join in 2022 
that was after 33 years in Hollywood. So it it took a long time, but I did get there. It's it's one it's a one step at a time thing. And you know, personally, I you know it I it is it's I don't think it's realistic to expect. Now, uh, as Brianna said, there are high school students that wind up with their own show. There are lots of people that take off like a rocket. There's a danger to that too. I would much rather have a career that goes like this than a career that goes like that. And I think you said that too, in a way, no? because you did a lot of different things in order to be able to make your own short films, etc. cetera. Um, and but pretty much this this kind of first your passion you have to be also very I guess adapt to each situation show that you are really willing to do that didn't change now basically the way of going into the business out of school today has not changed to a couple of I mean, just a few years ago when you were young and uh, and and went into the whole thing or or do you think there is a something changed so with, with all what you said the tiktok stuff etc like maybe the way you uh, i your think there's there's more opportunity uh in some ways right now we're in a trough where you know the industry as a whole uh, planet-wide the industry is is down um but that will change um and so whenever there's a trough like that there's opportunity also there's opportunity for um new ideas and they start looking in different ways. When I was at the television animation conference in Ottawa, uh, as I said a couple of weeks ago, um, they were talking about the need for short, shorter film content. They're looking for shorts. So they're, they're going to festivals, looking at your shorts that you're creating in college or whatever, and looking for the next thing that will inspire the next generation and so that could end up on television it could be that they test it test the waters with a, a piece and see where it goes from there that's what they were talking about doing and that was uh you know i was seeing i was listening to uh broadcast companies from everywhere from uh ireland to france to uh canada all over the place all over the planet talking about these needs that they're they're exploring so i think there are more in some ways, there's more opportunities, even as it looks like it's a, a harder struggle. Um, I think that some jobs are going to be uh, uh, harder to get into because there's a lot of layoff right now, and that that will um, that will mean that maybe there's a, a veteran animator that will get a job before you because they have you know if you're coming out of college. But that's just an opportunity for you also to look at it and. The, how do you look at those things? Do you look at it as like, I can't get a job? Or do you look at it as like, here's an opportunity for me to make my next short film and, you know, put it in an Annecy and see what happens? It's already an hour. Uh, maybe John and Brianna, um, I don't know, one, two, three words for all our students who might want to go. What is your, what, what were your words you would tell them, say, keep that in mind? Like not an advice, but say something that you can keep. But one you. thing I would say is, along with more opportunities than ever, um, there's more animation than there ever was before, in part because of streaming. Streaming allows there to be uh, content created for niche audiences that people who have a specific interest. In the old days, when there was a couple of television channels, I mean, that's all there was. And to make a movie was very hard. Now, there's, there, so there's more content being made than ever. So there's more opportunity. There are also more schools than ever, certainly in France. There are, uh, um, there is a school for everyone that wants to go. So I think it's a great time to be young. I would just be optimistic. That's Good. And not to forget about France 2030 in Marseille, there will be even more schools coming up. So France is a good territory <laughs> if you're looking at us. So optimism and you do, is and great. You don't always I love have it. to be able, you don't have to be able to speak French at all these schools. No, that we're changing in that. But to live in France, maybe it's still good to speak a little bit of French. You might well, rem but <laughs> remember that the the our international students in Paris. <laughs> Yes. Um, English is most of their already for most of them. English is their second language. So they come and they do survive. They, they do. You know, eventually, if they stay in France, they learn French. But at least to begin, they don't have to be able to speak.
You can you can get along at least in the capital or a, 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 any of the bigger cities. You can get along in English. I, I like encourage, your optimism, I optimism and it's encouraging, not... Brianna. You have two yes, words that we I, can give them. So I I feel like you know one of the words that I used a minute ago is fearlessness. And how do we become fearless? W meaning that we take risk without um, necessarily. Um, letting the cost of those risks um, stop us. So how do we do that? And it's, it's different than I think being brave, um, but fearlessness comes out of being in a community where you can feel safe and where you can try things and be supported and inspired by the community that you're in. So I would say young people, find your community of other people to support you. And it's, and it's, Finding not just a school that you enjoy or want to go to, but finding your friends that if they're long distance friends, whatever, build your community, build your tribe to help you support yourself so that you can try things in a safe space so that you can build those skills and so that you can step out of that safe space and be able to show the world the amazing ideas you have because you have amazing ideas and everyone wants to hear them really, but they are, you know, you just don't know how to connect with them. So getting them out there where you can show them and talk about them and um, show your films, that's really important. And maybe you can start by going on uh, the ASIFA website, which is, I think, asifa.net, N-E-T, because yeah. you will see all the different countries have their own initiatives around, yes. show, uh, around animation films. And maybe that's where you start to connect also with your community. So thank you oh. so much. Long life can to I, our, our animation. Thing. Yes, please go ahead. One <laughs> more thing. I'm sorry, because you remind me of it. We are going to be for next year as the 65th anniversary ah, yes, of uh, ASIFA. We are doing a worldwide initiative on the, the um, goal of peace. So animators from around the world, kind of inspired by what the Russian animators did when Great. Russia invaded the Ukraine, the Russian animators spoke out against that by creating short films. Um, and so we're kind of, we're taking that idea and we're expanding. We're not talking about which side anybody's on. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of like, we have to stop killing each other because we have differences. We need to be able to have a way to talk about things. And so we're using the one word peace as kind of our way of approaching that with short films. And we're going to have children involved with it around the world through the AWG, which is the Animators Workshop uh, Group. And we're going to be doing um, college and um, professional animators can join in on that. And then we're going to be showing those films around the world. So that's the goal is to step it forward a little bit towards peace. That's great. Thank you so much. That's the best ending anyway. Thank you so much, Rana and John. Uh, I will be very rude because we are quitting this and then it stops. But uh, thank you so much. I will come back to you by email and phone. Thank you so much. Thank you to all who have listened today and who will listen. And um, hope, well, long life to our animation day, but to animation tout court, comme on dit en français. Au revoir. Merci. Bye-bye. Au revoir.